that I forgot to give is uh, we're going to be turning to the Gospel of Luke in a couple of weeks, and one of the gifts that the elders would like to give to everyone is a Gospel of Luke, and the version that I will be teaching from, but even more, it has places for notes. I promise not to ask to see the notes. <laughs> uh, this is a great little resource and um, just a, a wonderful way for you to study ahead. And I, I hate to give homework, but I'm really hoping you study ahead so that uh, you know what we're going to be talking about before we talk about it. There's no spoilers, no spoiler alert. Um, when we get to the Gospel of Luke, you know, Jesus is born and he dies. I mean, I hate to spoil it. Um, but he raises again from the dead. So, um, you know, again, spoiler alert. It's all right there. So we're looking forward to uh, having those to give to you as soon as they come in. Uh, the only drawback is you need to write your name in it on the inside because if you write it on the outside, unless you have those really cool pens that write on black, we won't be able to tell who it is. All right. Uh, this morning we get to turn our eyes to Ecclesiastes. Mm. Oh. I've been waiting for this, not just Ecclesiastes, but to be in the pulpit again. An opportunity to study and then share together that study. Ecclesiastes. Um, this morning we're going to be looking at um, chapter 12, verses 9 through 14. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. In that version, this passage has the title, Fear God and Keep His Commandments. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd, my son. Beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Ecclesiastes is a memorable book. Many common sayings come from this book. You've probably heard some of these, such as vanity of vanities, all is vanity, or there is nothing new under the sun. Perhaps you've heard eat, drink, and be merry. That's from here. How about a fly in the ointment? Gross. Um, cast your bread upon the waters. Here was a favorite of Bible college students, and probably students everywhere, of every age. Of making many books, there is no end, and much study wearies the body. <laughs> and perhaps the most famous, to everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven. Now it turns out that turn, turn, turn is not in the original words. <laughs> now, if you got that joke, then perhaps you know the birds. If you didn't get that joke, I'd say ask your parents, but I think we're rapidly approaching the point where you ask your grandparents what that means. That's right. Ooh, all right. Well, Ecclesiastes is also the source of my favorite Old Testament passage. And since we're getting to know each other, I thought I'd share my favorite Old Testament passage, and then next week we're going to be looking at my favorite New Testament passage. I'm hoping this gives you a snapshot as to what I'm like, um, so you can be better prepared. Um, my favorite Old Testament passage is Ecclesiastes 12, 13 through 14. But these verses need a little bit of context, because they're the conclusion of the speaker and his book. So we start with verse 9. Uh, speaking of context... The name of the book comes from the title of the person speaking, at least in its original state, and Ecclesiastes is essentially the same thing. Now, in your Bible, depending upon the version, he calls himself speaker, preacher, or teacher, and it can mean all things. Literally, it's the one who addresses the assembly. 
The book itself, there's no signature attached to it. It is essentially anonymous. Now, evidence inside of it sure seems to point to Solomon, but because the scripture is silent, we've got to be careful making too many assumptions. What we do know is that Ecclesiastes has been accepted as scripture, the holy word of God, since the early days of Israel and her people. And this book, it's read during the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, I don't know if you're up on your feasts. Feasting is good. Um, this feast remembers the days that Israel lived in temporary camps until God delivered them into the land of promise. This feast is typically a joyous one, and you could sort of think Thanksgiving when you think of this feast. The use of Ecclesiastes, though, is an interesting one for such a joyous occasion, and it seems to point to a need for somber reflection concerning our faith in the light of a holiday of joy in order to establish some balance. Now, one commentator wrote about this book that the theme of Ecclesiastes is the necessity of fearing God in a fallen and therefore confusing and frustrating world. Now, that wasn't written last week. Mm. Mm. Key themes, this commentator says, include these things. The tragic reality of the fall of man. The vanity of life, too. Uh, that life passes like a vapor, like the fog that gets sucked in here for a time and then is gone. Three, the reality of sin and death. Four, the joy and the frustration of work. Five, the grateful enjoyment of the many good gifts of God. Six, the fear of God. After sharing his wisdom across 12 chapters, the fear of God is the conclusion of the preacher's work. That conclusion is the focus of our attention as we look first to words of truth. When we look at the first couple of verses, but we'll be looking at Ecclesiastes 12, 9 through 14 in total. Words of truth. Let's zero in on verses 9 and 10. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge. Mm. The context of Ecclesiastes and Proverbs, these are wisdom literature, they're not the only ones, and they both tell us that wisdom itself is a gift from God. But what is wisdom? The Bible defines wisdom differently than some people might think. It's actually defined as practical ability to apply knowledge to life. It's meant to be everyday stuff. For example, there's a t-shirt you can buy that has this quote that kind of helps us understand what this means. Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing that you don't put it in a fruit salad. <laughs> Practical stuff. Now, it's possible that you've met people that have knowledge. Well, if you've ever known someone that was so smart that they were, let's just say not smart, that's wis or rather that's knowledge without wisdom. The preacher wants us to have both. And he's been granted godly wisdom, and because of that, he has a responsibility to share that knowledge and the use of it with others, and that's us. The preacher, he says, he was weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. It's one of the things that make us think that Solomon may well have written this. The arranging of proverbs, you know, it can indicate that Solomon is the preacher, but maybe not. This is what it does tell us. The text tells us that the preacher was intentional. He studied and studied hard. He lived out many lessons, and then he arranged things for us so that we could learn without going through the things that he had gone through. Now, his study is study in the Word of God. In that arena, we have a greater benefit than the preacher because we have more of the Word of God. His study would be in God's person, who God has revealed himself to be in that Word. And his study would include God's requirements of man. 
From that effort, the preacher wants to share with you some practical ways to live out the knowledge of God in his word. And he took care to do it very well. You would be blessed in the reading of Ecclesiastes. The preacher continues, the preacher sought to find words of delight. Well, that's nice of him. Verse 10, the idea here is that the preacher spent time to speak and write in ways that were clear and understandable for his audience, for us. He, he wasn't trying to hide wisdom. He wasn't hoping that we'd have to suss it out like a bunch of clues. Uh, it's really God's wisdom, and he wants to pass it on, and it should be available to everyone. But it wasn't just smooth words. He did want to find words of delight, but that doesn't mean that we would be wowed by how well he taught as far as his smoothness. What he wanted was to distill God's wisdom down into easy-to-understand pieces in memorable ways so that we would have them on hand to use the wisdom as we live life. Understandable words, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The preacher was sharing his wisdom, and he was doing it from a position of righteousness. If this is Solomon, he either wrote it very early in life or very late in life. He had to learn some really hard lessons, even being the wise man that he was. He spent a lot of years as a wise guy, not a wise man. The preacher here, though, he's not forwarding an agenda. He doesn't want to pass on to us fleshly wisdom, earthly wisdom. I mean, anybody can do that. He wants to focus on being right before his God. And as he does that, he's going to write words to us that are true, true words. He's not trying to lie or hide. The truth of God. Is precious and he wants to share that with you and he wants to share that with me so we can understand so we can have the same knowledge and then the teacher is going to pass on wisdom to help us live out this knowledge practically this goal is his whole point this is why he wrote the book we don't have to wonder this is why what do we do with this introduction to this passage. Well, one thing, you don't need to have eloquence to be wise, and I hope that comes as relief. Uh, I mean, some folks, they sound eloquent, they're smooth when they talk, but so is a snake oil salesman. <laughs> uh, it's not a bad thing by itself. Uh, some folks, they come across as very intelligent and very well educated, and there's nothing wrong with that either. But wisdom isn't merely big words and a good education. In fact, this wise man is trying to put it in understandable words, not just big words. I mean, we all know well-educated fools. That's not what we're going for here. Wisdom comes from God. It's a gift from God. And this gift is available to everybody, whether they're eloquent or not whether they've got some degree or not. It is available to us in the Scripture itself. Now, some of us are going to understand parts of the Bible better than others. And maybe some of us are going to know how to apply it better, too. We can help each other with that. But all of us have access to the Word of God. All of us have access to what the preacher studied. We could all do well to heed the wisdom from a very upright teacher who shares with us truth. shares with us the scripture. You know, when, when we encounter a wise person, wise in the ways of God, sometimes it's going to come from a poorly educated person, but a godly person. This is the goal as we witness and share the truth of God with one another and with the people of South Beach. The truth we have to share is not our own. It's not meant to be so lofty it's unapproachable. And it is found in a place where everybody has access to it. There is a knowledge of God that is available to everyone through the scripture. So the preacher begins here with words of truth. And now he's going to move to some wise goads. Ooh, a goad. Verses 11 through 12. He says here, the words of the wise are like goads. And like nails, firmly fixed, 
are the collected sayings. The collected sayings of the scripture. Words of wisdom, like goads. You guys know what a goad is? It's a device that a man would use in this era and in the world all over still to steer oxen. It's more of a rod than a whip. And you don't beat the oxen with it. You tap the oxen with it. And if they go too far this way, you tap them. And then they when they move this way, you tap them. It's a goad. Tapped from the goad, kept the oxen going in the right direction, neither wandering to the right nor to the left. But even more than a temporary course correction, which the scripture does for us, biblical wisdom must be permanently affixed in our lives. It must be nailed down. These truths must be nailed down in your life because of who they come from and what authority he has. They are given by one shepherd. Who's the shepherd? It's not the speaker. He's got a shared understanding with his audience, one that I hope we all share. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 80, the Lord is the shepherd of Israel. The preacher is letting you know he's not hitting you with his stick. The wisdom is not his. He's sharing with you and with me the wisdom given by God to correct our course. And if you're anything like me, it's not like a one-time thing. It is a constant need to correct course. Um, since this is from God, not the speaker, if you are a sheep, if you're one of the Lord's sheep, be a good sheep. Hear the voice of the shepherd. Respond to his goat. Obey. That's, that's who we are, the Lord's sheep. Now, a goat sounds kind of harsh. Nailing things sounds very harsh. The preacher, he's going to soften it up here a bit. My son, beware of anything beyond these. It's kind of like John the Apostle. The Apostle, he liked to refer to us as beloved, as little children. The preacher speaks to us as sons, and he may indeed have a son in mind, but that includes us. He takes a warm, paternal tone. Listen to me very carefully, son. You've got to be careful. Be wary of anything beyond the collected wisdom of God handed down to us through the prophets and the apostles. Be careful. He adds to that, of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Be careful. But he's not telling us to be careful concerning how engaging a book is, or how exciting it is or isn't. Some books are really not very exciting. Rather, there are many competing voices, competing writings, claiming to be wise, telling you, you should listen to us, read our book, hear <laughs> what we have to say. This is even more true in this day and age. We have a non-stop access to voices, writing, information telling us what we should think, what we should believe, how we should vote, everything we ought to do. People will be happy to tell you what you should do. It's available on your phone 24 hours a day if you have a phone like that. No one could hope to read everything written. No one could hope to hear every voice that wants to tell you what to do, even if they were true. Only one book only one exists with a genuine claim to wisdom. Anyone with a basic ability to read can find it in their language. The whole of it can be read in 90 days. Maybe a little bit more if you want to focus on something. There is one book that should receive your utmost care and dedication to the wisdom of its contents. That's your Bible. I mean, just 
just to make sure I'm not preaching wanted to be clear. Let's be clear. It's the scriptures. What he tells us here is that you need the Bible to be wise. Without it, it's not going to happen. You can't do without it. Not if you would be wise concerning salvation, who God is, who man is, and what he requires of us. There are many books. Some of them are by very godly men and women. Many, many more are not. My son, I such truth claims warily. Like the preacher says, the truth claims of books by the most abundant and godly authors must still be evaluated as to whether or not they convey the wisdom and the truth of Scripture. Now, you may have a favorite Bible study author. You may have a favorite musical composer. Even your favorites, the Puritans. Uh, depending upon how you feel about the gentleman, you have people like MacArthur and Sproul and Lawson that write many, many books. My every sermon must be weighed and eyed warily, my son, as to whether or not they agree with the truth and the wisdom of the Bible. And if not, then the study of such things is weary. It's wearisome to the body. It's wearisome to spiritual life and health to take in things that are not true. The teacher has shared words of truth. He's putting the truth to work as a goad to help us go neither to the right nor to the left. And now he's going to talk about your whole duty. The end of the matter. All has been heard. Well, the preacher is using a phrase from his language that really kind of highlights, puts some lights around, some arrows, telling us he is summing up the intent of his book he is making his concluding point. If you want to know what the main point is, here it is. In other words, this is the nail. Get out your hammer. Nail this down in your life. Fear God. And keep his commandments. There are times in which the fear of God is not a popular concept and uh, sometimes people try to play his traits off of one another like they're somehow contradictory well god is love absolutely god is 100 percent all that he is always and it never contradicts now in me it contradicts and you it contradicts and god no contradiction the fear of the lord we are told is the beginning of both knowledge and that's the passage we read this morning and wisdom proverbs 9 10. This fear, properly understood, is the key to a life that is not vanity of vanities, that is not meaningless. This is eternal life. Now, fear and love of the Lord may sound like they're in opposition, but they are close, personal companions. This fear, in the language of the speaker, is a fear that includes love. It contains within it concepts of being respectful. Moms, dads, when your kid needs correction, there's a certain attitude you want back from them as you have to do what is necessary to get them on a straight path. This fear is respectful and it is reverent. It is full of awe as to who God is and who we are. This fear is a fear that leads to obedience, and Jesus said that if we love him, we will obey him. Also, fear of the Lord is an idea that he is our father, and he is our shepherd, and his hands will, together with love, be a strong motivator to obey what he says. I don't know if you've ever heard an old country tune by Holly Dunn called Daddy's Hands. It's a good one. Our Daddy's Hands. Why should you 
fear God. The speaker explains, has a couple steps here as to why. For this is the whole duty of man. We don't have a phrasing in our language that really captures exactly what he says here. But the language goes far, far beyond duty. Instead, it indicates that this is the essence of mankind. This is what God created you for. This is part of the relationship that you have been made for that you would bow to your maker, that you would adore him, love him, yes, fear him, and obey him. The teacher is pointing us to a life of worship through adoration and obedience. And yes, it includes a healthy fear of how hard the goad may have to tap to get us back on course. Uh, the rabbis, they teach that the whole world was created with obedience to God in mind. Jesus told the people, if you're not going to shout and sing, the rocks will. In our Christian history, children in times past, and in some places still, are taught with a series of questions and answers. One of the most famous of these, the very first question that is asked of a child, what is the chief end of man? The answer is, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. To do both is to respond to Him as our Father, and it includes fear. To enjoy this relationship with Him, you must be His obedient child. The same way that the relationship with our children stays secure when there is respect and obedience. Why should you do this? Again, He continues to explain to us, for God will bring every deed into judgment. Your dad may have been easy to fool. This dad is not. Think about it for a minute, though. The pure, unadulterated judgment of God. If we don't consider anything else and his solution to, to judgment on us, we just consider judgment itself. It is a terrifying emotion. For those who are not in Christ, they, they're not scared enough. God's judgment is, is scary. This isn't an earthly court. This is a judge that knows everything. He can't be lied to. No attorney can outsmart him. His laws are never contradictory, unlike ours. So he can't be stymied in his court in any way. 